Welcome to Gospel Preaching, a presentation of Gospel Time Ministries, Incorporated. I'm Dave Rigg, coming your way from my home about six miles north of Albion, Illinois. The scripture for my message today comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, reading verses 19 through 22 from the New King James translation of the original Greek text. Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, verse 22, which is the focus verse of my message today, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Would you pause just a moment with me for a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come now asking for your blessing on the reading of the Holy Word. And I pray, Lord, that you will guide me through the Holy Spirit to deliver this message today in the way that you want it to be spoken. And I also pray, Lord, that all who watch this might receive from this message today what you have intended for him or for her to get out of it and to apply it to his or her life. This I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Well, I want to begin by telling you a little story this morning. It seems an elderly couple who had a 57 Chevy decided to take a drive on a Sunday afternoon. So as they're driving along the countryside, enjoying all of the beautiful scenery, the wife says to her husband as she looks across to him driving there, Honey, why is it that when we were first married, we sat so close together when we were out riding in the car? The husband thought for just a moment, and then he said, I didn't move. Hmm. You see, when we ask God why we aren't so close to him as we used to be, there's a reason for that. God tells us that it's up to us to get closer to him. And so through this message today, I hope you will be truthful with yourself, and ask yourself, have I moved like the wife had obviously done? She sat close to him while they were dating, and perhaps after they were first married, but over a period of time, she scooted over to the passenger door side of the seat of the car. Here's point number one on my message to you today. God wants us to draw near to him. Again, from verse 22 today, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. So you see there, friends, God is telling us that if we want him to get closer to us, then we are going to have to get closer to him. Now, there are other verses similar to what I've just read to you right here in the book of Hebrews. For instance, 4.16 says, Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. From Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, He is able to save forever those who draw near to God through Him since he always lives to make intercession for them. And another one, Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who draws near to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So, clearly the Bible is telling us that it is our responsibility to make an effort to draw near to God. That probably poses a question for you. How do we do that? How 
do we do that? We know that God is up there in heaven. He's not in the room with us right now so that we can reach out and draw near to him and throw our arms around him. So how can we draw near to him? You see, yes, God is in heaven, yet he is as near to us as the door of faith. Listen to Psalm 42, verse 2. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Answer that question like this. How I will come now, while John is preaching, I am praying, Father, I come, I come, I draw near. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 13 and 14. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye search me, when you shall search for me, with all your heart, and I will be found for you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations, and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Now, obviously, these are words to the Hebrew people after they had been taken into bondage into Babylon, but there is still some application there for us in this day and age. James chapter 4, verses 8, 9, and 10 from the New Testament says clearly, friends, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. But again, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So see, friends, when you and I decide to get closer to God, we are doing exactly what the Bible says that he wants us to do. Friends, you know this, God loves us. He loves to draw us close to him. Just like, you know, your, your children, your grandchildren, uh, your spouse, you love to draw them close to you and, and hug them. So it's good and it's uplifting for us to draw near to God and do that often. And as we draw close to God in prayer, in attending worship services, as we open up the Bible and read his word, we recognize the fact that God truly does love us. We know that his love for us is everlasting. Let's face it, as you look back over your life, there are some people perhaps in the past that you loved, but for some reason they stopped loving you. With God, that will never happen. He will always love us. God's love doesn't disappear because we have sinned. So the question is, do you want to draw near God? Well, my first suggestion to you is try praying. When was the last time you really prayed, Lord, draw near to me? I'm trying to draw near to you now, God. Try prayer as your first step. You know, it's very clear as you study the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we read the story of Jesus, we see that he is often found there in the scripture in prayer. And he also taught his disciples to pray as well. And then in the New Testament, in, after we get past the first four books of the Bible, we often find the readings of the Apostle Paul uh, as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write several letters to churches at that time. And we find many times Paul was teaching his followers to pray. Paul, or Paul often spoke of his continual prayers. And we know this, the apostles in Jerusalem, according to Acts chapter 6, gave themselves to prayer. Psalm 55, 17 says this, Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. So 
there's a suggestion for us in that very verse there. Try three times daily for prayer. Schedule it like this. First, when you wake up, the first thing in the morning, when your eyes open up after a good night's sleep, hopefully, that's a good time to pray to God. It doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out prayer. Just pray to the Lord. We should pray to God, friends, and we should thank Him for giving us another day of life. We should ask Him to let us be a good Christian influence to the people we come in contact with that day. Secondly, pray the last thing at night. When you go to bed, before you go to sleep, spend some time praying Him. Thank Him for keeping you safe through that day and keeping you in good health through that day. And third, set aside one period of time to pray, and that would be at noontime. I know some of us are in the habit of praying over our noontime lunch or dinner, whatever you call it, and that's good. But uh, go beyond just think, thanking Him for the food, but also spend that time in prayer. Ask God to make His presence known to you in a special way. Now, again, these can be just short times of prayer. They don't have to be long, drawn-out prayers. But as it said there in Psalms, pray morning, noon, and night. So just try to be faithful in your prayer time. Psalm 119, 164 says, Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous laws. Now again, after you get in the habit of praying morning, noon, and night, that doesn't mean that that's all the attempts that you should make in being close to God and drawing near to Him. Make a habit of speaking brief words of praise to God as you walk throughout the hours of the day. Again, whatever you might be doing, say, thank you, Lord, for what I just saw, or thank you for what uh, you just helped me to do. There are many things that you can do throughout the 24 hours of the day, or at least while the hours of the day you're awake, to praise God. So let's move on to point number two. Jesus understands our weaknesses and problems. That's point two. Jesus understands our weaknesses and problems. Hebrews 4, verses 14 and 15 say, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So, as this, these verses I've just read to you suggest, as we come with confidence to the Lord Jesus, remember, friends, that He sympathizes with our weaknesses. He does not despise us. Yes, we are sinners, and we fail God many times. We commit sins sometimes that just make us feel ashamed of ourselves. But friends, when we do that, that doesn't mean that Jesus turns his back on us and despises us for the sinful things we've said or done. The Savior we are approaching has been through, as the Scripture says, what we are going through in our mortal bodies. It says very clearly he was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did that, or he walked through that temptation without stepping forward into sin. So in his presence, friends, we will find not condemnation, but as the verse says, mercy and grace. I like those two words. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 28, Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you don't get anything else out of this message, friend, soak this in. Jesus wants to be close to you, and Jesus wants you to be close to him. Jesus loves you. And so when you are feeling weary, in those times when you feel burdened down, friends, those are the times to draw near to Jesus. He will give you rest for your soul, as the Bible says, and as it was clearly the words that he spoke in Matthew chapter 11. So come, and come often daily to Jesus Christ. James 4, beginning at verse 7, says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will free from you. Listen to this, verse 8. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Last week, if you watched this message here on gospel preaching, you know that I told you a story from the sinking of the Titanic. Well, I have another one of the stories from that tragic event. On Wednesday, April 10th in 1912 in Southampton, England, eight musicians boarded the Titanic as second-class passengers. Just five days later, on April 15th, playing together for the first time, all continued to play in hopes of calming their passengers as the big ship, after hitting an iceberg, was clearly going down. These eight men are considered heroes. Here are the names of those eight musicians. Theodore Ronald Braley. He was a pianist. His body was never recovered. Roger Marie Braco, he was a cello player. His body also was never recovered. George Alexandre Krenz, he was a violin player. His body was never recovered. Percy Cornelius Taylor, he played the piano and cello. His body never recovered. John Wesley Woodward, another cello player. His body never recovered. John Frederick Preston Clark, he was a bass violinist, but his body was recovered. It was eventually buried in Nova Scotia, Canada on May 8th, 1912. John Jock Law Hume, a violin player, his body was also recovered, and it was buried at Halifax, Nova Scotia. And finally, Wallace Henry Hartley, a violin player and the band leader. His body was also recovered, but two weeks after the ship went down. His funeral was on May 18, 1912, and his funeral was attended by over 1,000 people, with 40,000 other people lining the procession route as the hearse brought his casket to the cemetery. Amazingly, Wallace's violin was also recovered. So, friends, the musicians on the Titanic were working for less pay and no benefits listed as second-class pass, second passengers, but living in third-class accommodations as that ship made its way across the Atlantic Ocean. Life on that ship was very hard for those eight men. They worked from 8 o'clock in the morning till well past 9 o'clock each night. And as you know, if you've ever watched any of these movies about the Titanic, Nearer, my God to thee, is forever associated with the sinking of the Titanic. One survivor of that tragedy reported that it was the last song played by that Titanic band as the ship was going down. You see, those eight musicians helped more than 1,000 dying people draw near to God. And all eight of them died when that ship went down. 
I'm going to close by reading just a few of the lyrics from that song, Near to God. Nearer, my God, to thee, nearer to thee. I'm not going to sing this for you. Even though it be a cross that raiseth me, still all my song shall be nearer, my God, to thee. Nearer, my God, to thee, nearer to thee. Though like the wanderer the sun gone down, darkness be over me, my rest a stone, yet in my dreams I'll be nearer, my God, to thee. There let the way appear, steps unto heaven. All that thou sendest me in mercy given, angels to beckon me nearer, my God, to thee. So friends, in closing, I've got to ask you this very important question. Do you today feel close to God? Maybe you were when you first got saved, and that's great. But maybe time has passed, and like that elderly couple riding in the car, you've drawn farther away from God. And if you're truthful, perhaps today you have to admit you're not near to God as you used to be. Well, if that's the case, friends, don't you think it's time that you tried to do something about it? The Bible clearly says it's our responsibility to draw near to God. And as a result, the Bible promises that He will be drawing near to us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, I thank you for the opportunity to come each week to deliver these messages here on Facebook Gospel Preaching and on YouTube. I pray, Lord, now as this message goes out that you will use it to touch the hearts and the minds of the people who watch these messages and that you will do your marvelous work in their lives as they let the messages soak into their hearts. I pray, Lord, that if it's your will, you'll give me another week to prepare another message and come again next week with another sermon from your holy word here on gospel preaching. This I pray in Jesus' name and amen. Well, again, thank you for watching this message today on gospel preaching. Hope you're telling other people about this. All of the message I've preached since the beginning of the series uh, are still available on Facebook Gospel Preaching and also on YouTube. So if perhaps you've missed some of them, maybe you'd want to go back and, and check out some that might be of interest to you. Hopefully I'll have a chance to come back with you again next week with another message from God's Word. In the meantime, may God richly bless you.